Have you ever wanted to have a snack, but the bag was hard to open? And then you respond by applying a little bit of extra force, and instead of just opening the bag, you tear it apart, scattering the contents everywhere. I kind of feel like that is what has happened in the last video. Among other things, we looked at the frequency response, and I feel like I need to cover about 10 different topics right now. I realize, of course, that is impossible, and I will just have to pick a couple of them to cover them briefly for now. In this video, I would like to look at the frequency response and come up with a way to quickly graph what the transfer function might look like as a function of frequency. For all but a select few people, a graph of a function is much easier to interpret than the function itself. Something about having a picture seems to free a portion of our mind from the analysis of the actual function and move on to interpreting the consequences of that function. Last time we looked at a graph of the voltage gain as a function of angular frequency. One of the things you might have noticed was that the frequency was on a logarithmic scale. Why, you might ask? It has to do with the wide range of values with which we were dealing. The frequency response was being plotted from a value of 1 radian per second to 100 thousand radians per second. In addition, in the plots that we looked at, all of the interesting stuff occurred before we reached 10,000 radians per second. If we were to graph the function on a linear scale, everything would happen in the first 10% of the graph, and it would be very hard to discern any detail of what happens at the lower end of the graph. When we use a logarithmic scale for the frequency, we can more easily interpret the behavior of the circuit. Why then did I not plot the vertical axis on a log scale? One, for this particular situation, the voltage gain only changed by a factor of 10, so there was not a huge range of values. And two, I did not want to throw too much at you at once. Let me introduce you to Alexander Graham Bell, everyone's favorite Scottish inventor that invented telephones or at least got to the patent office first. He's probably best known for the invention of the telephone, though he invented other things. He also founded the research facility that eventually became Bell Labs. He did a lot of work with sound and has the unit of the Bell named after him. We generally do not use the unit of Bell anymore. It has been determined that one-tenth of a Bell or a decibel is a more practical unit. The decibel itself refers to a ratio of quantities. It can refer to the ratio of the pressure of a sound wave relative to the background pressure. That is the context that most people have heard the term used. It can refer to the ratio of power of light transmitted through an optical cable relative to the power of the light that was sent. It can refer to the signal output from an amplifier relative to the signal that was input. For our context, we are interested in ratios of power, voltages, and current. For the active filters, for example, we are interested in the ratio of the output voltage to the input voltage. A little bit on the decibel. One of the practical arguments for the decibel is that it relates to human perception. For instance, every time the power behind a sound doubles, we perceive that as more of a linear increase. So decibels are more of a natural unit. A single decibel may also approximate be the limit of perceptible difference for sound levels. But this varies with frequency and the intensity of the sound. To see another practical consideration, we probably should calculate a power gain in decibels. If we use a reference of 1 watt, then the power in this case, in decibel watts, is 10 times the log of the power divided by 1 watt. Note that the W is added to the end of the decibel unit only because the power being referenced is 1 watt. If this were an arbitrary ratio of powers, the unit would only be a decibel. One of the things that happens when we convert to decibels is the multiplicative factors become additive factors. So if we increase the power by a factor of 10 and another factor of 10, each of those increases corresponds to a 10 decibel increase. I would also like to point out that doubling power results in roughly a 3 decibel increase. That's an important point. Decibels are related to power. Most often when we are dealing with circuits, we are first interested in voltages and currents. However, the power in resistive circuits is related to the square of the voltage or current. If we do a decibel conversion of the ratio of the output power to the input power, we would take the ratio of the square of the output voltage to the square of the input voltage. That would be the same as taking the square of the ratio. The same thing applies to decibel gains of currents. As we might remember, raising the argument of the log function to a power is the same as multiplying the log function by the same power. So the factor of 10 is multiplied by 2. For that reason, when we talk about voltage gain in terms of decibels, we use 20 times the log of the absolute value of the output voltage over the input voltage. We can gain some insight into the frequency response and the relationship to the Bode plot, that is a plot of the decibel gain as a function of frequency, by looking at the low-pass filter we developed in the last video. 
If you have not watched that video and want to know where this transfer function comes from, you should stop and watch the video on operational amplifiers and energy storage devices. Otherwise, you can just treat this as an arbitrary transfer function. The behavior of the transfer function can be summarized by looking at how the output versus the input varies with angular frequency. For small values of omega, the denominator is essentially one and the magnitude of the output over the input signal is 10 volts per volt. There's a negative sign in front of the function and the imaginary portion is not significant yet, so we have a phase shift of 180 degrees. When the angular frequency is such that the imaginary portion of the denominator becomes j times 1, the magnitude of the transfer function is reduced by a factor of 1 over the square root of 2. That also corresponds to a phase angle of 45 degrees in the denominator, which subtracts from the original 180 degrees, resulting in a phase angle of 135 degrees. At high frequencies, the denominator is dominated by the imaginary term. The magnitude of the denominator makes the gain limit to zero volts per volt. Since the denominator is essentially imaginary for large values of omega, the resulting 90 degree phase shift will subtract from the original 180 degrees, giving us a 90 degree phase shift. On the graphs of magnitude and phase versus the log of frequency, we get these. Both ends of the graph limit with quantities that are constant with frequency, with any change occurring over a relatively small range of frequencies. Now we'll look at a Bode plot of the transfer function. As I said before, a Bode plot is a plot of the decibel gain and the phase shift versus the log of frequency for the transfer function. To determine the decibel gain, we need to take 20 times the log of the magnitude of the output voltage relative to the input voltage. Remembering some properties of the logarithm, products inside the argument of the log can be written as additions of log functions, and divisions can be written as subtractions. Therefore, in this case, we will end up with three terms. 20 times the log of 10 plus 20 times the log of 1 minus 20 times the log of 1 plus j omega over 1515 radians per second. Performing the same types of limits as we did previously, we see that for small omega, the only term that is non-zero is 20 times the log of 10. That results in a decibel gain of 20 decibels. The phase angle is still 180 degrees as it was before. When omega is equal to 1,515 radians per second, we have 20 times the log of 10 minus 20 times the log of the square root of 2, as the square root of 2 is the magnitude of the complex number. This results in a decibel magnitude of approximately 70 decibels or a drop of three decibels. The phase angle is as before 135 degrees. As the angular frequency increases to large values, the subtractive term will be dominated by the imaginary portion, so it will increase with omega. That means that every time the angular frequency increases by a factor of 10, the decibel gain will drop by 20 decibels. The decibel gain will linearly decrease for as long as we choose to graph the function the phase angle still limits to 90 degrees. The change of the magnitude response from a limit response to a linear decibel response is one of the things that makes decibel plots relatively simple. Instead of having to be concerned with the shape of the transfer function as it approaches the limit, we have a straight line. Now we should try to generate a Bode plot of the same function. A Bode plot is a graph of the frequency response of a system where the decibel gain and the phase angle are plotted versus the log of frequency. Since we are working with logarithms, all of our products or quotients can be written as additions and subtractions. That means we will be able to determine the contribution of each of the terms in the transfer function and then combine the graphs. To begin, we can eliminate the term that has the log of 1. Adding 0 at every point is just busy work. We will graph the 20 log 10 term. There is no frequency dependence and the term has a magnitude of 20 decibels, so it will contribute a constant line at 20 decibels. The second term is slightly more complicated. We see that for small values of omega, the real portion will dominate, making the decibel gain equal to 20 times the log of 1, or 0. When the imaginary portion is dominant, the decibel gain will decrease by 20 decibels for every factor of 10 increase in frequency. The only decision is to determine how to handle the function when the real and imaginary portions are on the same order of magnitude as each other. Knowing the behaviors at low and high frequencies, and that the changeover from a predominantly real function to a predominantly imaginary function starts at the corner frequency, we will approximate the Bode plot as two linear pieces on either side of that corner frequency. At low frequencies, we'll will approximate the gain as zero decibels. Once the corner frequency is reached, the graph will decrease at a rate of 20 decibels per factor of 10 in frequency. We call the factors of 10 in frequency decades, so the slope will often be stated as minus 20 decibels per decade. With these two pieces drawn, all we need to do to determine the overall plot is combine the plots point by point, resulting in this. 
Turning to the frequency response, we already know that the phase shift is 135 degrees when omega equals 1515 radians per second. That is because we start at 180 degrees and have dropped by 45 degrees. If we go on to calculate the actual phase angle as we increase and decrease the angular frequency by factors of 10, we see that the limits are almost completely reached by the time we are two decades of frequency away from the corner frequency. We may also note that the majority of change in phase angle has occurred within one decade of the frequency on either side of the corner frequency. Since most of the change occurs in that range, it is likely that the simplest approximation is to draw the phase shift changing over one decade of frequency on either side of the corner frequency. Looking at the transfer function, we can see the easy term to handle is a minus 10. A constant has no phase angle, but a negative sign corresponds to a change of 180 degrees. There is no frequency dependence, so we will have a horizontal line at 180 degrees. For the term with a frequency dependence, we have already discussed that at 1515 radians per second, the phase angle is 135 degrees. As the angular frequency increases from that point, by the time the frequency is increased by a factor of 10, the imaginary portion is much greater than the real portion. So we will approximate the function to be entirely imaginary at that point. As the frequency decreases, the imaginary portion becomes less relevant and the phase angle now drops to zero degrees. Again, we approximate this to having a occurred over a factor of 10 decrease in angular frequency as that is the point that the real part is much greater than, that is a factor of 10 larger, than the imaginary portion. Once we have reached those limits, we assume the phase angle stays constant or that the contribution of the frequency dependent term is completed. Having determined the contributions from each term, we can combine them into a Bode plot of the frequency response of the circuit. These Bode plots do not give an exact numerical behavior of the magnitude and phase. They are a reasonable first order approximation of the transfer function of the circuit. There are also simple and quick ways to get such results. Remember that the inaccuracies in the Bode plot are most apparent near the corner or break frequencies. Circuits are generally not designed to be used at these frequencies, making these Bode plots even more reasonable approximations. If more accuracy is required, we can make the plots more accurate by taking into account that the magnitude plot is three decibels higher at the corner frequency and adjusting the phase angle angle by the 5.7 degrees we are off by when we approximate the phase shift to be complete a decade away from the corner frequencies. For now I'm satisfied with knowing that we are aware of the inaccuracies. Today we have looked at a first order approximation of a Bode plot. We started by defining decibels as 10 times the log of a ratio of power gain. We then adjusted the decibel calculation to account for the squared relationships between voltage or current and power. This resulted in the decibel calculation based on voltage or current being multiplied by factor of two. We then applied the decibel calculation to a transfer function and drew a first order graph of the decibel magnitude versus the log of angular frequency and a first order plot of the phase shift as a function of the log of frequency. These were called Bode plots. Next time we will cover the basic building blocks of Bode plots. Until then, go out and make it a great one.